Jacob with his story about the cow. So when I was a little kid, I really wanted to get a bunch of quarters, just this huge pile of quarters that I could keep in my room and show off to all my friends and say, oh, look at my huge pile of quarters right there. And pretty much that was my dream at the time. The dream was to get a bunch of quarters and keep them. And I was getting quarters pretty slowly, but I was getting quarters. And my brother got this new piggy bank, and my parents started giving him quarters just so he could put quarters in his piggy bank. And it wasn't fair. Why would you give him quarters and not give me quarters? Because I obviously deserve the quarters more than he deserves the quarters. It's not fair. So that wasn't fair, I thought. And I was just walking by thinking how this wasn't fair. And my parents suggested an idea that night. They suggested getting a garden. Now, I wanted a garden for two reasons. The first reason is that I didn't have to deal with going to the store. And the second reason was I would get more quarters because if you think about it, all the money that my parents would give me, all the parents, sorry, all the parent, all the money that my parents would spend on vegetables would go to me. And then I would have a bunch of quarters and my brother would have nothing. And so then it would be fair. So, so Operation Garden came into action and we made a garden and we planted all our crops and everything was going fine until the rabbits discovered there was a garden in the neighborhood. You see, we have a lot of rabbits in our area and they keep eating every single thing they see and they it's really annoying. And I wasn't getting all my quarters because the rabbits were eating the crops and so my parents couldn't harvest the crops so I wasn't getting my quarters. You see, it's not fair. Um, so my parents and I sat down at dinner again another night, and they suggested getting a cat. And I also thought this was a great idea because I wanted a cat, and two, I'd get more quarters. <laughs> and like, I thought that when I'd come home one day, there would just be this nice cat and I could touch it and pet it and things like that. No, I was really wrong. <laughs> it was probably the worst cat that the pet shelter had, and my parents just decided to pick that single cat. I went up after school one day, and I saw the cat sitting on their front porch. And so I tried to pet it, and my mom was sitting next to me, and she said, be careful. But I pet it anyway, and he hissed at me. He hissed at me. I was six years old. I had to jump away because I thought he was going to bite me and hurt me. And he probably would have hurt me if I didn't back away. And that's when I knew the cat was evil. And the cat was evil. It was terrifying. It destroyed everything that came into its way. It was like a machine of destruction and pain. We would be walking by one day and the cat would turn up and be like, oh hey, I'm about to ruin your day and bite my friend in the shoulder and it would hurt and then they would have to go to the doctor and then it would all be really bad and then it would all be my fault for getting a cat. <laughs> it, we locked, so we locked the cat in the basement and we started just keeping it in the basement. But that didn't solve our problems. I go into the basement every once in a while and the cat lives there. And one time I was in the basement getting something and I saw the cat just charging right at me. And I, the only thing that was around me was a table. So I climbed up on the table and started sitting on the table. And there was nothing to do but wait till the cat walked away because it obnoxiously decided to take a nap right under the table where I was sitting in terror. It wasn't only me that was suffering from this. My dad had bicycles to work every day and he needs to get his bicycle from the garage but the cat lives in the garage. So every day before he has to go to work, he has to put on a bicycle helmet, some boots, a baseball bat, and a lid from one of the nearby trash cans and prepare for war. <laughs> it was horrible. I couldn't, I didn't know when it would possibly end. And it all ended in a single moment. 
The cat would like to run away for days at a time and then come back. One day it found its way to a pet shelter and then the pet shelter brought it back to us. I don't know how it found the pet shelter because it was about 150 miles away. So in one day, the cat disappeared and it never came back. And that was the end of the cat, of the horrors that it caused. And I started losing everything that I gained because while the cat was there, I lived in terror, but I was getting quarters. And now that the rabbits were back, I, were lo I was losing my quarters. And yeah, it was bad for me. Um, then what happened? Where'd you move to? Uh, and I left for Israel for a few years, and the garden died, and it was all for them. Through 
like a medieval city, because the cobblestones were from around the same era. So then there was the tide. They had a lot of coastal attractions and a huge tide. Just for example, they had this like diving board. And when the tide was out, ish, it would be like three, I mean, five meters up. When it would go in, it would be, it would take like two off. Very big tide. Um, then they had Le Petit Bet, which was this fortress. And when the tide was in, it looked like just a fortress, but when it would go out, you could see this little rocky outcrop outcropping area leading up to it. And I've always loved climbing. So I decided to go climbing on it. And my mom had a friend in college, and they lived in Britain. So we decided to meet in France. And my mom's friend has a kid who's around my age. So he loved climbing too. So we had a great time climbing on the rocky outcropping and brushing against the walls. So then there's Le Grand Bet. It's this huge hill, like around three stories up. And on one side, it's just like sheer rock face with like huge rocks underneath. walking across the little cement walkway that was visible when the tide was out, getting there, I decided, I don't want to take the stairs leading up. I'm having such a good time. I might as well climb a little bit. So I started climbing. And it was a really easy climb for me. Like, I was flying up there, no problem. And then I thought I pulled myself onto the top. I expected the top to be this like straight level top. No. I ended up in this little like dent of a thing. And the only thing to grab onto was dried up grass, pebbles, and sand. So I was sitting on a perch around two and a half stories up with nothing to pull myself further up. It was too steep to walk or crawl up, except for dry grass, sand, and pebbles. There was no way to lower myself down. I need a handhold to lower my legs down onto the rock face below and go down from there. No handholds. I'm, I wasn't about to bet my leg on some pieces of dry grass supporting me. Suppose I have a better height, height for heights than I give myself credit for. Until my mom saw. My mom's screams echoed off of the rock face. And you know, your parents aren't supposed to scream unless like the nuclear bomb's about to go off. So I freaked out. She was she started like screaming as at dad. How could you let him get this high? And I, I completely lost it. I'm like, I'm dead, I'm not going to survive, it's over. My sisters were content being on the other side, just like hanging out. I'm not even sure what in the places they were doing. So, but I decided, and I wouldn't have much honor in telling this story <laughs> if they had to like get the rescue chopper, <laughs> chopper to save me. So I decided, I can get myself out of this. <laughs> and I still don't think it was very likely. I mean, after all, there wasn't a lot of stuff to get myself out of it. My mom was screaming, climb down, but I knew from like a climber's eye that was the exact opposite of what I should do. Because there were no handholds. I would plummet to my doom. <laughs> so I decided I'll go up following my original plan. So I, I grabbed onto a, 
a piece of grass. Yes, a piece. But to give myself credit, it was quite a lanky piece. <laughs> and it like shrivels away in my hand. It was quite dry. So I grab on after my initial like freak out of like it just shriveling away. I grab onto the base of the grass clump with all the strands together and pull myself up a little, kind of like crawling up with the piece of grass to keep me from falling back down to the perch I was at and possibly off the perch to my doom. So then I pulled myself up again on the next grass clump and every grass clump, it got easier and easier until I was walking. I was worried I was going to get lost because the grass started to get a lot thicker until I was walking through like a forest of really tall grass. But I just kept going straight till I reached the top. And then when I went, I took the stairs back down and I couldn't have believed how close, I couldn't believe how close I was to dying. And I realized how smart I was. Just thinking back to it, the sand was like slowly slipping away sending me down with it, just with my weight on it. If I had gone up, I would have probably eventually slipped down. So, I thought my horrors were over. And my mom was scolding me, how could you have done this game, you're so stupid. That, that was a really bad decision. And the tide starts going in. So, the lifeguards start running across the like cement walkway and screaming, go, 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 and ushering everyone back. And we're like the last group, or one of them. So we start waiting. And my younger sister, Ren, is like three or four feet tall. And she was like four at the time. We'd like carry her back. And I was pretty freaked out. There were, the waves occasionally would, a stray wave would try to like push you off of the little perch of cement you were on and into the water. I mean, I could swim, so it wasn't really that bad, but I didn't want to get like, what, a lot of really wet after. That would just be too much for me. So, I remember as I reached land, like, such like relief flowing down me. And that's my story. <laughs> This is so exciting to be out of school, out of the four walls of the school, and presenting to family and fellow classmates the amazing work you are producing so quick already in French Drama Workshop in November. You already have so much to showcase. We are interweaving French poetry through the stories. There are four students from French Drama Workshop who will be reading their self-written and self-discovered, really, poems. These are not words they found from a list given to them. These are not words out of a textbook they have memorized. These are words that they have found, that they have chosen, that they have learned, because it reflects them. So as a class, they have learned from each other. Vocabulary words that will never show up in a textbook, but that have relevance and importance and you will hear their beautiful pronunciation, and through the work of Madame Wilson, you will experience the expression they give to the French language. We are so proud of you to take this step today. Bravo. I'm Marco, and I'm gonna be reading my French poem. Marco, droll, intelligent, optimiste, et heureux. Fils de Joseph et Alexandra, qui voudrait gagner des millions, qui se sent super, qui a besoin de la famille et des amis, qui donne les rires, qui a peur de voir des malignants, qui veut voir le monde, l'habitant de Skoki, Maruszewski. Thank you. Next. Uh, Lisa, would you like to do your poem next? 
too much of anything because things can result in a messy way, in a disgusting way. But I still eat a lot, so yay. <laughs> And there were no 
woken one, so I was really confused. And then I went back to sleep, and I woke up, and all four plates were stacked in the sink. So it was just confusing and scary, and yeah, that's my story. and I'm going to tell you the story about the yellow bird. So, can I play video games? I said to my dad. He said no, obviously. So, <laughs> I'm going and trying to play video games and trying to watch TV, trying to play on my computer. My dad says no to everything. It takes a lot. <laughs> and so, I go and I decide to read a book. I'm, I'm very bored, and so I'm reading my book, sitting by the window on the couch, and I look outside, and I see an, the bird feeder across the street. And I'm looking, and there's this yellow thing there. And I'm like, is, they probably just got a new lawn ornament. So, but then I realize it's moving back and forth, back and forth. So I'm like, hey, Dad, are there any yellow birds native to Illinois? Because he likes birds. Yeah. <laughs> and so he's like, no. And so he goes and takes his pair of binoculars and looks outside, and he sees that it's a bird, and it's a domestic bird, because there's obviously no yellow birds native to Illinois. So we go outside, and we take a picture. Then we come closer, and we take a picture. And he's, and he's thinking it's a canary or something. Obviously, I'm not so good with this. And so he comes up and he's like, that's a parakeet. We're like a foot away from it now. And so we go and he's like, let's pick it up. So I go, I'm like, okay, I right, go and pick it up. And it goes right on my hand, but I'm worried I'm gonna hurt this poor bird. So it flies onto the wall of the neighbor's house. And now it could like fly onto a tree or fly somewhere else. So. And that's not good because there's cats who live around there and a peregrine falcon and he would not survive that and the winter was coming up. So, not good. So, my dad goes and he puts his hand around his neck and picks it up. And now, I freak out. Like, my mind just like... <laughs> I'm so happy. Like, I'm like, can I pet it? Can I pet it, Dad? Oh, it's so cute. Can I pet it? And so, I'm loving this bird right now. And so he brings it inside and he's like, where are we gonna put this stupid bird? <laughs> and I think back to a couple years back when we had a butterfly, when we raised butterflies. And I remember we have this butterfly thing. It's a, like a pop-up cage. So we put him in there, we dump some bird seed in, and he starts eating. So that's a good sign, that means he's Definitely not a wild bird, because he's from Australia. I don't think he, he raft flew him over. So, <laughs> so we, so I call my mom now. This is the moment of truth. My mom is not a pet person. I mean, and she doesn't want to clean up after stuff for me. She barely cleans up after me and my brother. So, <laughs> and so we go, and I call my mom. My dad's phone, and. I'm like, hey mom, what's up? <laughs> and she's like, nothing. What are you, I'm driving, what are you doing? So she's driving home from work. I'm like, I found a bird, can I keep it? <laughs> she's very amused by this statement. Like, she is thinking I'm joking around. And I'm like, no, I actually found a real bird. And she's like, okay, you can keep it. And I'm like, did you just say that? Did you just say I could have a pet? And she's like, 
Dion. And then she, she's like, okay, I came home from coming home, and I'll see the bird when I get there. And I think after she hangs up, she realizes what a mistake she's made. <laughs> and she's regretting this a, quite a bit. So she, I, I, my dad's like, what did she say? And I'm like, yes! <laughs> and now I've, I've got a bird, and I bought one more, one more bird to accompany him. And so now I have a bird named Petey, the end. Martin was a one sauce, so we left, and Mama Martin took a nap, 
And once they finally woke up, my mom was like, well, we should go to Walmart to get some ice cream. So obviously I was like, why not? <laughs> so we drove down to Walmart, and as we're getting our ice cream, there's this kid, he's about 16, blondie, and his name is Joshua. And he comes up to me, he's like, I like your shirt. Uh. <laughs> and we were driving back, and Martin said to mom, well, we could always get the wedding bands on layaway. And that, <laughs> that really pissed my mom off. She had this hatred in her eyes that she could have slapped him right then and there. But she didn't. And, now, and I think now mom hates Martin just a little bit more. <laughs>
So I'm like standing there because like I didn't expect her to do that, so I'm standing there like. And so I put the cat down. I slowly go up to her. And before I knew it, my fist collided with her jaw. <laughs> so she falls down to the ground, and I'm like surprised that I had the guts to do that. But after I regain my conscious, I look down at her, I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like so proud of myself. And so the teacher comes, she, and Piper's like crying, and I'm just like standing there, still looking at her like. And so the teacher calls my mom, and so mom comes, and my mom gets, yells at me, and she's like, why would you punch a child? Why would you do that? It's not you. And I'm like, okay, okay. Then my brother comes home from school, and he's like, why'd you get picked up early? And I punched a girl. Good job. I punched a girl in pre-K. Best decision of my life. <laughs>